Okay, let's go ahead and read our passage. We're in John 20. Um, we are in verse 19. I'm not going to get too far. I know last time we did a pretty big section of scripture, um, but you're not going to be so lucky this week because I got some stuff to say. Um, all right, let's go ahead and read John 20, verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, the sins, of, the sins have been forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Um, so thinking about this week, about the huge trial that the disciples had just been through, because uh, like we said in verse 19, they were hiding for fear of the Jews. And we're talking about the religious leaders of the day and the, they're now hiding from the jews so i'm thinking about the trial that they were in uh they for three years they had been following jesus um and they gave up their lives to do so and they thought this was going to end in the kingdom reign of christ uh, the, as the messiah was going to take his uh, official place in jerusalem and uh, at the beginning of the week, it looked like that was actually going to happen. Um, everyone hailed him as king and the son of David, and everyone knows exactly what that means. That means he is the rightful heir to the throne. And now they're sitting in a room for fear of their lives. What a dramatic change. So it got, to me, got me to thinking about our own trials and the purpose that we go through them. As they're going through this trial. And here you see on the screen, uh, this is them coming out of the trial, coming out of the storm. And I once heard a preacher say a long time ago, there's only three stages to life. There's either uh, the first stage, you're going into a storm. The second stage is you're in a storm. And the third stage is you're coming out of one. So if you're coming out of one, you're probably going to be getting ready to go back through another one at some point, not too far down the road. Um but I wanted to um, read a few things to you because I think this is extremely important. Um, Job represents the the quintessential uh, you know poster boy for going through trials, right? So in Job one, we're just going to read a little section here, and I can't. I think I didn't mark it, so hang with me for a second. Here we go. A little more. Job 1. We're going to start in Job 1. I'm just going to read uh, verses 6 through 22 because I want you to understand what's happening here uh, and, and to us as we go through trials. This might help shed some light. Uh, this is verse, what did I say, 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. You think, well, that's odd. I thought Satan wasn't allowed in heaven anymore. We'll continue. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth, walking around it and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless man, an upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan Answered the Lord, said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and all his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. That means to kill him or touch his body as far as physical. So Satan departed 
from the presence of the Lord. Now on the day when his sons and daughters were eating and, and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabians attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another came, also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you while he was still speaking another also came and said your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house and behold a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they died and i alone have escaped to tell you then job rose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshiped he said, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked I shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a song title, isn't it? We don't usually sing it when we think about these kinds of things. Through all this, Job did not sin or blame God. And he lost everything to the Sabians as far as his The heart of his produce, right? He lost the animals, the servants who were working for the produce that supplied food for the, everyone, the provisions for the food. Next, the fire that came from heaven, which was his servant says, the fire came from God. Burned up his sheep, his servants. You could see this as maybe the, the, the clothing, for the wool for their clothing, right? The provision for their, their clothing. Now they had their... Now they had a big problem because they, they don't have much food coming in because of all that they lost. Now even their clothing is, and maybe even more, and their sacrifices and all that kind of stuff. And now even his transportation was taken. Their camels and their servants to mine the camels and care for them. So they would, be, and they lost pretty much, he's losing all of his provisions. And then the last one was his heart. He lost his children, all of his sons, all of his daughters. And Job's response puzzles us. We're baffled by it. Because we've been indoctrinated by a world that says that we don't really seek after God. We've all been indoctrinated to that response our first response is to throw our hands up in the air and say why lord why did you do this why did you allow this as if he was the author of evil and the wicked things this is why job's response is so puzzling to us verse 21 or I'm sorry, uh, verse 20, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground. If we stopped right there, that would be everyone's response, right? We tore our robe to show how destroyed we were over what's happening. He shaved his head, and that's to show more in all of that, and he fell to the ground in complete agony. But then it says he worshipped. Is that the response that we have when we go through the severest trial? Think about the trial that he just went through. In one afternoon, he lost everything. And yet he says in verse 21, Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So you got to ask, what differs from Job's response to that of our own? Asked another way, you could say, what's wrong with us that we don't have Job's response? And that kind of led me to a thought, and I wanted to show you guys this little video. I, you know, I don't like to play videos during my sermon, but I do like to show you guys different um, pastors that I like and, and 
you know, look, look to for, you know, some sound doctrinal teachings and that kind of stuff. So I do like to show you guys these things on occasion. So if you would play that, that next video. Since God is slow to anger and patient, then why, when man first sinned, was his wrath and punishment so severe and long-lasting? Time out. <laughs> Didn't we just have that question a second ago? We did. Yeah, it's a little, I think little, we little did. Nuance. That God's punishment for Adam was so severe. This creature from the dirt defied the everlasting holy God. After that, God had said, the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. And instead of dying, Thanatos, that day, he lived another day and was clothed in his nakedness by pure grace and had the consequences of a curse applied for quite some time but the worst curse would come upon the one who seduced him, whose head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. And the punishment was too severe? What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. I mean, this is what's wrong with the Christian church today. We don't know who God is, and we don't know who we are. The question is, the question is, why wasn't it infinitely more severe? If we have any understanding of our sin and any understanding of who God is, that's the question, isn't it? So that's kind of the question then. What is wrong with us? Why, what's the difference between our response and Job's response? And I wanted to play that because I wanted to like kind of get your attention for a second. It's a pretty strong statement for a preacher to make. What's wrong with you people? Uh, but what's wrong with all of us? Why do we not have Job's response? Why is that Job's first response and ours is completely different? He didn't have to get down on his knees and pray about how he was going to respond. He just did it. His natural reaction was to go to God. So let's get some perspective. I'm going to read from Romans 5, um, verses 1 through 11. I want you to hear this. Therefore, we have been justified by faith. We have, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained our, the, our, instruction, our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope, in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, our trials, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance brings pro proven character, and proven character Hope and hope that does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given us. Who was given to us, I'm sorry. For while we were helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than how, having now been justified by his blood, shall, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were his enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Um, and not only this, I'll finish this last, last part off. Not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. You can go back to John if you've been flipping around with me. <clears throat> so you need to understand that the peace of God is, is not just a get out of jail free card. That's not what the Christian faith is about. That is a byproduct, you could say, of God's redemptive plan is for us. But that's not the point. And so many Christians act like that's the point. I just want to get to heaven. You know the old song, everyone wants to go to heaven? 
you know, I forget who sings it, Kenny Chesney or something. Everyone wants to go, but no one wants to, whatever the heck the words are. Anyway, um, <clears throat> the point is, everyone is wanting to go to heaven, but they don't want to be, they don't really want to have their life adjusted. But God's unimpressed by all of our messiness, and how we come to him. And one, one phrase that just really irks me when I hear it from a church leadership is when they talk about the authenticity of our church and the modern church. And this tells the believer that all you have to do, or the Christian, is all you have to do is, is believe the gospel and um, you can pretty much stay the way you are. You don't really need to improve. You just need to add a few things from Christ and he'll start changing you over time and you know whatever, whatever. You got, the love of God will just start flowing through you magically. Come as you are. That feeds man's desires to be complacent. Paul's description of the authentic man and woman is far different in Romans, isn't it? In verse 6, it was, we're weak. In verse 8, it was, we're sinners. It's not a, a sickness that we have and, well, you know, you just got to take a few things and you'll get better. He calls you sinners. And not only that, verse 10, he called you enemies of God. So we're weak, we're sinners, we're enemies. There's not a whole lot there that's lovable. So the difference between our response and Job's is Job has eternal eyes. Because we're not just looking for the, the one-way ticket that gets us into heaven. The eyes that have e eternity fixed in them. And Job's not perfect. But God did say he was blameless, and that was according to their standards during that day. But he endured more than, than many of us will ever endure. But he learned through the trials, the patience, to trust God. Because God took away all of his helps, didn't he? And Job's patience had to rely on God. And I'm going to read just really quickly, and I should have stayed back there real quick, but I want to read to you, and there it is right there, <clears throat> Job 42, verses 1 through 6. To, so you can see the reaction that Job had by the end of the book. So you saw what happened in the first part of the book when it all was coming down on him. Now let's see what his reaction is at the end of the trial. And he's coming out of the storm now. And Job, re, and Job answers this and said in verse one, uh, chapter 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this? Now he's quoting God. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I, and he's, God was getting on Job when he said that. And so Job is now saying, therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand. He's commenting on himself now. Things that were too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak. I will ask you and you instruct me, Job is saying. I have heard you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. He's, all right, Lord, I'm done giving you my, my, my word, my way of doing things. And I want you to keep as we get into, as we start moving away from the kind of introduction that I'm doing here, as we move into looking at the verses in John, I'm trying to set your minds up to understand why we're going through trials. Because it's really important for you to, to understand why we're going, th going through that. So I want you to keep the words, all these things in your mind, but especially James and um, James 1, <clears throat> verses 2 through 5. Keep these things in your heart as we go through the rest of the message today. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect. And I'm not talking, he's not talking about being perfect, but being perfected and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. And we'll discuss these things a little bit more as we go on. <clears throat> so I want to let's look now at John 
20, verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. If you remember, this was the first day of the week. We talked about it a lot last week. The women were all coming back. Now everyone's gathered at the upper room. Christ had risen. They had Some of them had seen him resurrected. But you notice they didn't go through the streets announcing his resurrection. They're not going and running around going, Hey, guess what? He actually came back, guys. You were all wrong and we were right. And we didn't even know that we were saying that. <laughs> but clearly they're they're still and they're still in shock mode they're still afraid they're in hiding there's still more to be done actually and jesus will end up teaching them over the next 40 days they're still in fear though by this point john 7 13 jesus uh uh, the John, the, the Apostle John, gives us a little a commentary on on this little, on this kind of what they're what's happening to them right now. Before they were bold, running around the streets and doing all these things. When Jesus was with them, now he's not with them. And listen to what John, the Apostle John, says in John seven thirteen. Yet no one was speaking openly of him for fear of the Jews. They were afraid of the religious leadership. They held the keys to daily life. Think about this in the end times. We, we, always, we always think about the, the tribulation, the great coming tribulation, how uh, when it, the one who receives the mark of the beast, they won't be able to buy or sell. So we're all, we're all freaked out all the time looking at the news, looking at it going, oh, what's the mark? I want to know what the mark is so I don't take it by mistake. So, this is what it would have been like during that time. If they were afraid for their lives, had the Jews found out who they were, you know, submitting to, or who they were, there's a chance they could get kicked out of the synagogue, out of daily life. They couldn't, they couldn't maybe they wouldn't be able to buy or sell in certain areas back near their homes. Oh, that guy, Peter, he was the one who was following Jesus. You know, the guy that we crucified for being a blasphemer? So this is what they're afraid of. This is a very real fear. We don't really get that in our modern lives because there's so many choices out there. But if our money were to come under control... The ability to buy and sell would be diminished, right? And that's a very real fear. But Jesus brings peace. Look at the verse again. So he said to them, peace be with you. And likewise, we should have peace to know that when we're coming out of the storm, there's something that we need to learn here. And not just for the end times, but for our daily lives, he gives the birds of the air the opportunity every day to find food. How much more will he make the opportunity for you and me? In his hands, the whole universe was created. And we should find comfort and security and a peace of mind. Listen to what Jesus said in John 14. Verse 27. Oh, one chapter. We're going to have a lot of scriptures today, just so you know. I'll try and go through as quickly as I can. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And he says right here, you, you heard that I said to you, I will go away and I will come to you. Here it is happening. This is not an ignorant bliss that they're going to suddenly feel, oh, Jesus said, peace be to you. Now we're you know, ignorantly blissful of all things in life, and we'll just kind of walk around with our heads in the clouds, which is what a lot of people, you, you kind of think sometimes, are, is that what they're promoting? Is that the peace? 
No, they're in the midst of deep trials. But there's a calm assurance that comes from Christ. Hebrews 13, or 3, verse 14 says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. When you are saved, you are saved, you held fast to the teachings of the apostles, the doctrinal things that, that people, someone led you to, to believe about Christ. They gave you the gospel. You heard the truth about Christ. And for once, it penetrated your weak heart, your sinful heart, or your rebellious heart, as Paul was saying in Romans 5. The gospel had a way of penetrating right down to the heart of your, of your bone marrow, down to the, the core. And he's saying, if you're partakers of Christ, hold fast to that. And sometimes when you're coming through a big trial, that's all you have is to go, look, I am a child and I don't really see a way out of this thing, but I know that God's got me. But I don't know how he's going to do that. It's okay to not know. You don't have to work out every little detail. You don't have to have the road map to get out of it. You have to know that God is the one who is guiding you through this process. And the trials are going to bear down on you. So you need to hold fast to that childlike faith that you had when you first came to know Jesus. Otherwise, what did you believe in? But James says that he allows trials, but let steadfastness have its full effect, right? Let it have its effect. It has a purpose. There is a reason why you're going through the trial. You may not like the reason. I'm sure Job didn't like the reason. Verse 20, John 20. And when he had said this, he showed them both of his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Not only did Jesus encourage them with peace be with you, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad when they saw this. This is unbreakable joy, right? This is unshakable, unbroken, lifelong joy. No trial that's coming is going to move them now. That was the purpose for this trial for them to go through. Of course, there's a lot of other reasons that are a lot deep, you know, deeper theologically that I'm not going to talk about, but if for nothing else, from their point of view, we went through all this just so that we were going to be strong. And you're going to hear in the coming weeks that Jesus is going to look Peter in the eye and say, you're going to die for me. And this is how it's going to happen. You're going to, want, you're going to be led to a place that you don't want to go. And you're going to stretch out your arms in a place that you don't want to be, you're going to be nailed to a cross, in other words. And Peter had to live with that for probably 30 years. When is it coming? Is this the time I'm going to be killed? When he started preaching the words, he didn't know when the next guy was going to come and grab him and nail him to a cross. But notice he preached for 30 years, unafraid, because his joy was unbreakable at this point. You can experience this. We do experience this. Think of what, how, what our life was like before Christ. And we've seen what he's done. And as God grows you and you mature in your faith, and if you claim real faith, you will experience a trial. And that's, you know, I, I know a lot of people like to, and praise God, you know, when, when someone's regenerated. But I'm not so busy patting them on the back for the great deed that they did because I know that there's a trial coming. And Jesus talked about the parable of the sower, right? And the seeds. And some received it with great joy and they made bold confessions. And then sometimes you come back four or five years later. Anyone remember uh, Kanye West's big confession to faith? Everyone in the Christian world was, Amen! Praise the Lord! He even wrote, a, wrote an album called Jesus is King. He had a church. He started preaching. 
It's been what, like four, three or four years, and now he's divorced. And his last record that came out is about as nasty as any of them that were out before he made his profession. No change life there. He had a great exuberant uh, display when he first came to his faith. And now he's gone. So you're tested to prove your faith. God is going to endure you through your faith. He's going to, he's the one who gives you your faith. Let's put it that way. And he's the one that supplies you with everything that you need for your faith. This is joy that testifies of God's goodness. Even in the midst of trials. Look at um, Luke 24. Luke 24, 39 and 40. You can turn there real quick. Just a couple of verses. See my hands and see my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, but they ever thought he was a ghost. As you see that I have, and when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, do you have anything to eat? And then what? They gave him a piece of fish and he ate it. To prove to them. And now listen to John. Uh, listen to John, First John, all the way in, in AD 90. Right? Jerusalem has been destroyed by this point, 20 years prior. All the apostles are gone except for John. They're all dead. They've all been killed in some type of way, and only John is left of the 12. And now he's exiled on an island called Patmos, and he pens these words. Listen to this unshakable joy. That which we have seen, that that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, and the life was manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it. They have unshakable joy, no matter what the size, no matter what the length of the trial, no matter the severity of the trial. Unshakable joy rooted in the truth of Christ. That's where you find your joy, in Christ. And it's not that you have this, like I said, it's not a, a weird kind of a, uh, uh, yeah, I'm joyful, you know, as I'm a Christian, I should be, I mean, you should have rock solid faith. I know that I'm going through the deepest trial right now. This is one of the deepest ones I've ever been in. But I know who's got me and it's Jesus Christ. If he could be killed and raised again, then he can surely raise me again through any of these trials. And that moves us to our third issue, or the third point in verse 21. So Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Their strength, their joy, the endurance is not without purpose. It's not only to make you feel better about what you're going through, so that you know that you, you have a purpose that you're growing in your faith. But there's a reason for the growing in your faith. If all they needed was Jesus to just kind of supernaturally supply them strength every time they were in a trial, he could have done that. And then they just move on from one trial to the next until they die and move on. That would be it. But we also probably wouldn't be sitting here today having these little Sunday morning meetings because no one would have went and shared the gospel. So their suffering and their trials was to grow them, and not just for their own self-confidence, it was to grow them so they would go out and do the work. Because Jesus says in John 17, 18, we went over it just a few weeks ago, probably a couple months ago now, but as you sent me, Jesus is praying to the Father, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in what? In truth. Uh, 
I had a note there for Luke 24. I think this is going to give us a little more. Uh, we read a little bit of Luke 24. Um, <clears throat> read you a few verses. You don't have to turn there. 46 through 49. And he said to them, Thus is it written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead in the third day, and that for repentance of forgiveness, or for forgiveness of sins, he would be proclaimed in his name, or that sins would be... Forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. And here comes the commission. Obviously, if someone's going from Jerusalem, it's going to be one of these guys, probably. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending you forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And we're going to get to that in just a minute. But I want you to see something else. So there's a mission there for them. They're not just being supernaturally charged up for their own benefit. Hebrews 3. The writer says this, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him. So he's saying Jesus was faithful to his mission, just as Moses also was faithful in all his house, for he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, Jesus that he's, he's talking about, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were spoken later. But Christ was faithful as the Son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence in the boast of our hope firm until the end. So he's saying, let our boasting be in the common faith. And it proves not to be worthless, not to be in vain. Why? Because we find encouragement in our trials. Unshakable joy that can't be uh, taken from us by its, in His sovereign control, that we understand that Christ is sovereignly in control of everything. But they're, they're getting ready to be sent out with a direction and a purpose. Now, they've been enduring trials for three years. So at this point, they're, they're on the other end of the trial, and they're coming out of it. Now they're pretty much trained. There's going to be a few loose ends tied up, as I said, for the next 40 days. And then when they're empowered with the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about in a second, they're going to be ready. So it's not only on their own strength, because they're going to get a special gift in verse 22. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And Jesus highlighted this issue in John 17, verse 12. He talked about that, about the apostles. Listen to this. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. What is he saying there? While Jesus was on earth, the disciples didn't need the Holy Spirit to indwell them. Do you understand that? He had their every need. If they needed protection, he protected them. If they needed food, he would create it. Right? Or they would do whatever they needed to do. But Jesus always sovereignly had control over their situation. But now he's leaving them. He's getting ready to go back to the Father. So he's going to give them a gift. Verse 22 tells us what that gift is. Receive the Holy Spirit. And when he said this, he breathed on them. There's a couple of distinctions you need to understand, I think, because there's a lot of confusion that comes around these things. In the Old Testament, you hear this phrase, and the Holy Spirit came upon someone. 
You don't understand that phrase is meant for the empowering one to do a specific work or a specific task. Maybe they're going to be empowered for a ministry or maybe they're just going to be empowered for one event. In Numbers 11, 22, 25, the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him, that's Moses, and he took off, I'm sorry, he took of the Spirit who was placed upon him and placed him, the Holy Spirit, upon the 70 elders. And when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But notice what it said right at the end. But they did not do it again. That was a one-time filling. You, get to need, you need to know that word. Even Balaam, the wicked prophet, had the Holy Spirit come upon him in Numbers 24. For a single task. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe, and the Spirit of God came upon him. And notice the words of Jesus past John 20 in Acts 1. Listen to what he says. Because the remember the apostles by this point had already experienced John twenty twenty two, which he breathed on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now in Acts one and verse eight he says, "But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit what comes upon you." Notice the power was for a given task because he goes on to say what that task is, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all in Judea and Samaria, and even to the end of the remotest part of the earth. Notice the contrast of those verses. When the Spirit came upon them. Completed work. Verses, verse 22. And he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Difference. Something different happening here. The New Testament uses the phrase, receive the Holy Spirit. And this speaks of regeneration. This speaks of the new birth. We talked about in John 3, like three years ago in March. We talked about how God, the Holy Spirit, comes from above, Anathan. And we said, you must be born again. That's the word, from above. There's nothing that you can do to be born again. That's... God coming from above to regenerate you. And it's receiving the Holy Spirit. But this is a new thing for them. They're not, they're not used to this. But this is Ezekiel 36 working out. I will place a new heart in them. I will give them a, a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in them. And now they're getting the new covenant. This is happening. And this is reminiscent of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. You don't have to turn there. The Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So they're breathing new life. And this is what receiving is. Receiving the Holy Spirit is the new birth. Just as Adam was on a special occasion, he was the first man to be, or the only man to have life breathed into him at that point, the only man, that was a special privilege for him. But all weren't born in that same fashion afterwards. We all weren't created. In, you know, mom and dad didn't go, well, let's go to the dirt and wait for God to create our baby. And he creates a little baby out of dirt and then he breathes life into him and everyone cheers, amen. That's not how it happened, is it? That was a special event for Adam. And here's a special event for the Holy Spirit being given Jesus is now standing before them in similar fashion. He breathed on them to receive the Spirit, and the apostles received the Spirit of God. This would be the first instance of that. The second would be Acts, when I should have turned there, Acts 3, or Acts 2, 38. You don't have to turn there. They're going to, they're going to go kind of quick. Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then again in Acts 8, 
it happens again. There's more Jewish converts being converted. Acts 8, verse 15. Now when the oh, started 14. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might what? Receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. The third time this happens in Acts 10. This is now with Gentile believers, because it hasn't happened to Gentiles yet. Now in Acts 10.44... We see it happen to the Gentiles. While Peter was still speaking these words, and the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message, all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on to the Gentiles also. For they were hearing and speaking with tongues, exalting God, and Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who has what? Received the Holy Spirit just as we did. So this is not a second blessing that they're receiving from a uh, some charismatic thing to do all these signs and wonders. They're receiving regeneration. And then finally in Acts 19, you have a few remnants running around from John the Baptist. When after John the Baptist was baptizing people, And it happened that Apollos was in Corinth. Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Hmm, interesting. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Notice that question. Did you receive it when you believed, like everyone else? And they said to him, No, we have not even heard that whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Well, into what were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. There you go. So, they're receiving the gift. This is what every believer receives. That's what Paul was saying. When you when you receive that, when you, what do you say? Oh, I messed it up now. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So he baptized them and they received the Holy Spirit. This is the gift of regeneration. Now there's subsequent fillings. And every time someone says, uh, it says in scripture, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. You see them doing the work of the ministry or doing some task. So, okay, now you're a believer. I'm going to try and clear this up a little bit. Now you're a believer and, and you are you know that you've been regenerated. You know that, that God is putting you through a trial for something, to learn something, to, to endure. So you can move to other believers and help and instruct them. But you say, well, sometimes I, I lose interest in the Bible. I'm not really studying it as much. Or uh, I have other issues that are going on in my life. Well, ask. That's what James says. If you have, if anyone lacks, ask. Ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying to do the Bible study. Lord, help me generate an interest here. Give me, you know, fill me with your spirit. Give me eyes for your word. Give me eyes and a heart to long for your word. Give me eyes and a heart for my, my husband or my wife or, or even, I mean, I've actually thought those things and prayed those things. I want to make sure, Lord, you give me eyes only for her. That's how sometimes we, we avoid sin. And you're asking the Spirit to do things that you can't do on your human flesh. And Paul says in Romans 7, you can't do it. Who will... Take from me this body of death. He's talking about a, a, a person who is saved and they're feeling the weight of their sin. Pulling them in that direction. No, no, no. It's okay for you to do that. 
And you have to fight it. And sometimes you need to ask God to give you those eyes. Lord, give me those eyes for for your word. The longing, Lord, build up in me a longing for your word. And interesting in hearing your word preach sometimes. I've done that myself. Because as much as I talk about listening to preaching, there's not always, I don't always want to listen to preaching. It's not always that fun for me. But it empowers us during those hard times, during those long and deep trials that we go to God. And you want to have that reaction that Job had, start asking God to, to supernaturally fill your life with those kinds of things. Lord, give me uh, the strength to walk away from sin, to walk away from the temptation. And then when the trials come, you have this habit built in you that you go to God first. So I need to move along. But I remember, uh, we need to remember what James said. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And he gives, he who gives you generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. And to all without reproach. It's an interesting phrase. MacArthur notes this means literally does not reproach. God does not reproach you. And you go, well, okay, you're still not making any sense. Let me, let me read what Calvin had to say, and I think you'll understand by the end of this. This will be very clear in just a second. This is added, lest anyone should fear to come too often to God. Those who are in the most liberal among men, when anyone asks of him, or acts often to be helped, they mention their former acts of kindness and thus excuse themselves for the future. That kind of cuts, doesn't it? Some of us, we do that. We kind of, well, I've already helped you out a whole bunch. I don't need to help you anymore. But here, John is saying, John Calvin, hence a mortal man, however open-handed he may be, you may be the most giving person on the planet. We are ashamed and too weary by asking too often. But James reminds us that there is nothing like this in God, for he is ready ever to add new blessings to the former ones without end or limitation. Does that help? God is always willing to empower you and to pour blessing into you. So you can't ask him too often for that same thing that you're asking him for. God, give me eyes for the scripture. God, give me a heart to long after hearing scripture or whatever. You can't ask, and he'll constantly. I, I do that when I'm writing these sermons. Lord, give me the strength to write you know, the message. Give me the strength, and I'm pouring into me. God, pour into me. Give me the power to preach the message with power. And often I find every time that God does that. Oh. Hmm. Got another little bit here. Let's um I tell you what, I don't like to do this, but let's let's chop it off right there. Because it's it's running long. And I got a little bit more. There is one more thing. I'll I'll just say this last little sentence or so, so that we can under, um know what to expect next week. And it deals with forgiveness. The end of the chapter there in John, or the end of the section there that we read, John twenty three. If you forgive the sins of any, the sins of that have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. We're, we're going to talk about that pretty good next time. It's pretty important to understand. Yes, he's talking about in ministry as, as they're getting prepared to go out into ministry. But I think it has some serious application to our own lives. So I want you to understand that first we need to take courage in your master. Right? He is at work in your life likely teaching you to bow the knee, to submit to him, to trust in him, not our own devices, not our own techniques, not our methods for, you know, dealing with things. To remain steadfast, like likely you've taken your life to get into this mess and it's going to take a long time to get out of it. The disciples were trained for three years. He didn't just say, okay, you guys are my disciples now. Hey, I think you're on your way. Let's, let's, you got it right, the right heart. Let's move it along. You got to remain steadfast. You got to hold fast to Christ. These things and these new doctrines, these new understandings of Christ, to trust in the teachings of Christ, they take a long time to really get moving. So you've got to hold on. Like Peter said, 
To whom else shall we go? It is you that has the words of life. And remember, we do have a purpose. And likely we're not ready for service yet. We may be still stuck on steps one and two. But if you are ready for service, you'll see where you fit and you'll understand. And you can pray if you don't know where you fit. And Lord, show me where I were. Put, like, put a desire in my heart for some ministry. <coughs> Sorry. Right into the microphone. And understand you don't have to have it all together. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And you can ask to be filled for those tasks, for those times in your life. Asking for a filling of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing charismatic about that. But don't ask to be filled with the power of the, the gift of healing. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the other gifts of the Spirit, you know? Or, or just helps from away from temptation. That's, by and large, that's going to be your biggest asking. The Lord, or like the one guy says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. That's a prayer. <laughs> That's a prayer that every one of us should be saying a lot more often, I think. Anyway, we'll get to the rest of it next time. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray.